As mentioned in a prior episode, we have 10 gigabit fiber here at our office. That's right, not 1,000 megabits per second or gigabit, but 10,000 megabits per second, 10 gigabit in both directions, upload and download. Theoretically, we could download a 25 gig 4K movie in 20 seconds or Call of Duty Warzone in just under a minute. That's crazy fast. But as I mentioned, those speeds are theoretical. In reality, you'll pretty quickly find that you're not limited by the rate at which you can download, but the rate at which data can be served to you. So I wanna demonstrate and explain why that is. Okay, so we're going to upload a YouTube video. We do that a fair bit here at Snazzy Labs. But before I take the file and drag it into my browser window, I first need to know what my network is capable of uploading at. So I've got a speedtest.net window over here. I'm going to press go and it will measure our total network performance. So my download speeds are about 4,700 megabits per second. That's pretty excellent. And our upload speeds are, holy crap, 9,289 megabits per second. Now there are eight bits in one byte. So I'm gonna do a conversion to make this a little bit more simple for people who are not quite as network savvy. 9,289 megabits per second is equal to 1,161 megabytes per second. So this can upload about a little more than one gigabyte per second. That's crazy. The video I've got here is 6.27 gigabytes. So if I take 6.27 and then I times that by the value of megabytes per gigabyte, which is 1,024, that gives me 6,389. And if I take that value and divide it by my network upload speeds of 1,161 megabytes per second, this video should upload in five seconds and, well, a little less than six seconds, 5.5 seconds. That's really fast. So let's take our 6.27 gigabyte video. We'll start uploading. And one, two, three, four, five. What? It's only 7% uploaded. Yeah, see, this is where things get weird. Speedtest.net chooses the physical test server that is closest to you in location. There are, and we'll explain this, a number of benefits to doing this. And it explains why my upload speeds on YouTube, while very fast, are not anywhere near what I'm technically capable of uploading. Sure, fast internet might be awesome, but at the end of the day, what's it worth if you're not being smart online? Private internet access helps solve this dilemma as the leading no-log VPN service. PIA has unlimited access to 10,000 servers in 70 countries, with dedicated apps for just about every platform you can think of. Windows, Linux, macOS, iOS, Android, and some really crazy ones. Now, your account can have simultaneous connection for up to 10 devices, something that most competitors just straight up don't offer, making traffic safer for the whole family on unencrypted networks and opening the doors to international and regional usage of Amazon Prime, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, Netflix, and more. PIA also has a kill switch that'll disconnect you from the network if your VPN connection drops, and with no logging ever, you can rest at ease knowing you'll be safe. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, you'd be nuts to not at least give it a shot. And there's no better endorsement than this. I, myself, pay for PIA and have for many years. It's a service I use every day. So go through my link to support my channel and get a 77% discount and three months free when you sign up. Okay, we need to first understand the difference between throughput and bandwidth because I've already done a bit of a disservice in this video by referencing my upload bandwidth as upload speed. Now, having more bandwidth makes your internet perceptually faster, but not technically faster. It just feels faster. You see, bandwidth is like a hose, and throughput is like water inside of that hose. So let's say we're trying to fill up a swimming pool. The larger we make the hose, the more water can technically flow through it at any given time. However, it's ultimately the rate of the water flow that will determine how fast we can fill up a pool. If we make the hose huge, but the water is still just barely trickling out, well, the pool's not gonna fill up any faster. And this helps dispel the common confusion that bandwidth is a measure of speed. It isn't. Increasing the amount of bandwidth only increases the amount of data that can be sent at one time, which only increases its perceptual speed. It feels faster, but its actual speed, the rate at which data packets are traveling, it's the same. Now, that's not to say that bandwidth isn't important. It is. However, how useful your bandwidth is 
can be determined by a number of different factors, not least of which latency. Now, this is a word we're most likely familiar with, but latency determines the duration of time or speed at which data packets can get sent from the server to you and back measured in milliseconds. Now, it's easy to forget, but the world is interconnected by a bunch of cables. There are literally hundreds of cables that span across the ocean floor connecting all of the continents and remote islands together. Fun fact, the cable connecting Svalbard to Greater Norway cost $80 million to construct, and only 3,000 people live on that island. So yeah, the internet's pretty important, and cables across the Earth make it all possible. Now, latency is unavoidable. The latency increases based on four main factors. Number one, the medium of transmission. For example, our modern fiber optic connection has a dedicated line directly to our internet service provider. But an older copper coaxial cable going through many nodes on its way back to the ISP would naturally have a higher latency. This is what most non-fiber homes have. Number two, the physical distance between you and the server that you're attempting to retrieve data from. Now, most fiber backbones travel near the speed of light, which means a theoretical round trip around the planet for a packet of data would be about 133 milliseconds. However, the reality is that end users like you and I, well, we're not directly connected to network backbones, and so there is latency that is naturally higher than that. Number three, routers or hops. Every time you make a request, that data needs to go through a number of internet exchange points, data centers, etc. Those all add latency. If you want to have some fun, open Traceroute on macOS or Linux or TraceRT on Windows, followed by a domain name or website or host IP to see how many routers that data has to go through to get to that destination. Now, if you're in the same city as a data center, you're likely to have fewer trace routes than someone who is, say, halfway across the world. And number four, simple CPU bottlenecks and storage delays on the server that you're attempting to contact. After all, servers are just really, really fancy computers, and smaller websites and smaller companies typically have ones that are not capable of as much throughput or traffic. Now, there are a number of things that internet companies do to lessen the effects of latency. A hugely popular way is CDNs or content delivery networks. Rather than send an entire web page or packet to every person that wants to receive it, no matter where they are in the world, CDNs minimize the effective distance between you and the server that you want to access by caching stuff in data centers that are just geographically closer to you. For example, Cloudflare, one of the most popular caching services, has a massive presence in Salt Lake City. So when I request a website that they're actively caching, the data is served to me over a private network rather than requiring me to go out over the slower public internet to get to that website or to retrieve the same data. So I get the data faster, I get the same data, the company that's hosting the website saves money, and it's I'm none the wiser. It's a win-win-win situation. Let me prove it to you. I'm gonna take a website, fiber.com, that I suspect may be cached by Cloudflare here in Salt Lake City. We'll verify that indeed with the CDN finder tool, Cloudflare is the CDN. So now that I know that, I am going to go into my terminal and I am going to ping fiber.com. And we'll see that, holy smokes, it is pinging it in less than one millisecond from this computer to wherever fiber.com is located. Now, it seems unlikely that it would go to wherever they're hosted in San Francisco or New York in less than a millisecond. So I suspect it's actually hosted, cached here in Salt Lake City by Cloudflare. And there's a way that I can verify this. I am going to copy the IP address that it reports. I will type trace route, paste, and then it's going to take a few seconds, but it will tell you, tell me the exact route that the packets my computer is sending go through to identify where it actually is. You see that it goes through Unify, which is actually our router, <laughs> and then it goes through our own IP address at our fiber hut that is uh, hosted by our ISP. And then it goes through our ISP's main quarters, and then it goes to uh, he.net, which is actually the backbone that services all of Salt Lake City to the greater internet. Then instead of going out to the internet, it goes to a local Salt Lake internet exchange, which is where Cloudflare and many other companies share their resources and cash for all of the customers in the greater Utah area. And then in less than a millisecond, it goes to a computer inside probably that same building, which is 104.16.154.71, which is where Fiverr.com is being served to me. Not where Fiverr.com is actually hosted, 
but right here in Salt Lake City. So cool. What was this video about again? Uh, just kidding. Let's circle back. Okay, speed test attempts to measure the maximum potential of your internet connection by selecting a server that is physically close to you with a minimal amount of latency possible and designed for maximum throughput. As soon as you begin to tamper with this foolproof formula, your network speeds will be affected. Distance, congested uh, network nodes, the lack of nearby CDNs, complicated trace routes, slow DNS services, etc., can all reduce your effective speeds. So you're probably wondering a couple things. Number one, uh, what can you actually do with a 10 gig internet connection? And number two, what can I do to improve my network speeds at home? So let's talk 10 gig. It's freaking fast. Now, normally, these connections are intended for larger businesses, where not speed, but bandwidth is necessary. Remember, the diameter of the hose, like an office building with dozens or hundreds of employees all using computers. We, we're an office of me and Derek. Yeah. We're two people. <laughs> so we can each use, in theory, extraordinary amounts of data. In theory. Remember all those things we just talked about that can slow your network down? Well, another bottleneck, and perhaps the largest, is simply the fact that the companies serving you data don't serve you data as fast as you can receive it. Not many people have 10 gig connections. You need special network cards inside of each and every one of your computers. You need certified CAT6 cabling, which is still very uncommon. And you need a 10 gig capable switch, which up until very recently have been prohibitively expensive for all but the enterprise who wouldn't have given a single 10 gig internet connection to one machine anyways. So what services will let us download at the speed of light? I guess technically it is. <laughs> the speed at which we can actually download. Well, you might think, aha, cloud storage services. Nope, not even close. In fact, these are almost always disappointingly slow. Google Drive only downloads at a paltry 120 megabits per second, barely even one one hundredth of our network capacity. Why? Well, my theory is that so people like me who only pay $12 per month for unlimited storage don't start uploading and downloading literally everything. Because after all, $12 a month is a lot cheaper than a $20,000 storage server. <laughs> There is only one instance that we and in all of our tests could even get close to saturating our network. And that was downloading about a dozen torrents and a couple of Usenet downloads simultaneously. However, we were still only averaging about four gigabits of throughput as our CPU and disk speed had started to become the bottleneck, both maxing out from uncompressing these downloaded files rapidly. Basically, there wasn't any way that we could max out our network on a single machine, even a fully loaded one. And it wouldn't be until we did that same task on two or three computers that we would eventually reach network saturation. And really, who needs to download 75 pirated movies simultaneously? Well, nobody, because piracy is illegal, and all of our downloads were most certainly legitimate. You probably don't even have a fiber gigabit connection, let alone a 10 gigabit one. Don't worry, at my home, I don't either. But what can you do to improve your network speeds? Is it even worth trying? Well, yes, you might be able to get perceivably faster internet by following a few suggestions. First, use a DNS service that isn't provided by your ISP. Lousy DNS servers are the number one culprit for slow web page loads. I use and recommend Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1 DNS service, which I have linked below. Setting this up on your router or even per device is extremely easy with their very detailed instructions. Secondly, use an ethernet cable. Wired connections are almost always faster, more stable, and unaffected by other devices on your network when compared to wireless. Now, if you have to use Wi-Fi or you wanna use Wi-Fi, move your wireless access points or your router into an area where the Wi-Fi signal isn't being suffocated. Do you have one of those Linksys boxes stuffed down in your basement cupboard somewhere? Try moving it to another location or consider getting more higher quality gear. I have a whole home networking retrofit video coming in the next couple of months on my first house that I just bought that's 120 years old and has never been wired up for anything other than, as far as I can tell, dial up. So if you need some help, stay tuned for that video. Third, I know this sounds silly, but restart your in-home networking equipment and computers. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to help family and friends with slow internet only to find that a simple reboot of their modem fixed some weirdo error. Hello, IT. 
Have you tried turning it off and on again? Fourth, install ad blockers and practice good browser hygiene. Ad media trackers can slow down your network connection like crazy. And dozens of open tabs, some with autoplay, background media, etc., can take you for a spin. And then fifth, call up your ISP. We just negotiated at our home internet connection, uh, moving from 600 megabits per second to nearly gigabit speeds by merely calling them and complaining about network performance. If you have multiple ISPs to choose from, use that as leverage to threaten leaving your current ISP to see if their retention department will offer you a better plan for the same price, or in some cases, even less money. Sixth, give this video a like if you liked it. That probably won't help with network speeds, but I, I, I don't know, it could. Try it. Thanks so much for watching this video, and as always, stay snazzy.